for the gift of this day and for our community of spiritual nurture and compassion, we give thanks. We light this chalice as a symbol of our faith. May our many sparks meet and merge in communion of heart and soul. Hello, and welcome to the Buckman Bridge Unitarian Universalist Church's weekly virtual worship service. My name is Carol Hawkins, and my pronouns are she and her. Unitarian Universalists are people on a journey, embarking on a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. We have no creed. Instead, we welcome people of all beliefs, whether they are theists, humanists, or atheists. We are guided in our living faith by seven principles. To learn more about us or about Unitarian Universalism, visit our church website or the website of our parent organization, the Unitarian Universalist Association. Good morning, Butman Bridge congregation. I wish I could be with you and worship this morning live and in person. And in fact, that's part of what I want to talk to you about in this moment of stewardship for the coming year. One of the things that I'm really proud of our leadership about is that they continue to have us meet not in person. As hard as it is, as hard as it is not to be together in person, we know that we are making the most loving decision that we can for the most vulnerable people among us. And that's what matters when we all regather, we want to all regather, right? So I'm really proud of our leadership and inspired by the strength they've had to take, to make this hard choice. And I'm proud of everyone who's pitched in to make worship so meaningful, to keep the church lively and active and going. We are an amazing congregation and I'm proud to be a member and I'm proud to be the affiliated community minister for Butman Bridge. And because of those things, I've decided to double my pledge this year. I don't say that to be braggadocious. I don't say that um, to make it sound like I'm doing a wonderful thing. I'm just sharing that from the heart to say it's so important to me to be part of a congregation with that kind of vision and insight and compassion for its members that I really wanna be supportive. And I know it's a hard thing to figure out how to steward a congregation that we're not meeting in person. It's worth it to me to say, I so believe in us and in the work that we're called to do and in our capacity to do that together that I wanna double my pledge to make sure that we keep going until we can meet again in our beautiful sanctuary, see one another's beautiful faces live and in person hug each other, drink coffee together, listen to sermons, argue in good spirited and respectful ways and come to deeper understandings about our values, our mission, and what it means to be Unitarian Universalists in a world that really needs our values. So I hope you will pledge as generously as you can for this year. And again, thank you for being the congregation you are and I just love being a part of you. Good morning. My name is Claudia Marshall, and my pronouns are she and her. Carol and I are sisters in eye care. Eye care stands for Interfaith Coalition Action Reconciliation and Empowerment. And we are working together this Sunday to bring this eye care themed service to you. Being involved in eye care has been a very empowering and enlightening part of my life. Eye care was the first ministry that I joined when I came to this church because it appealed to my inner longing to solve community problems. Eye care does this through people power, putting their hand to the task, researching issues in our cities, and then using the people power to influence city officials. We will be calling on you to attend the Nehemiah Assembly in April because if things don't change, they stay the same. We really hope that you enjoy this service. Hello and welcome to the Wonder Box. Our box today is heavy. I wonder what's in it. Let's see. Okay, we have a brick. I wonder why we have a brick. What do you do with bricks? Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Bricks are used to build things. Let's find out what needs to be built by listening to our story for today. Are you ready? Once there was a little girl who worried about the injustices she saw in the world. 
She would hear and read stories about people who had no access to healthy food in their community or no access to mental health care. And it seemed like most days there was a story of someone being mistreated or voices that called for solutions just being ignored. She wanted to do something about it, but she's only a little girl and, well, these are big problems. What could she possibly do that would make a difference? One day, when she was feeling sad about the situation, she told her dad what was on her mind. After listening to her problem, he was very quiet. Then he scratched his head, rubbed his chin, and said, let me tell you the Bible story about Nehemiah. Now, Nehemiah was a good and faithful man who was born as a servant to a king. One day, a friend of Nehemiah's came to visit him and told Nehemiah of how the walls in the city of Jerusalem that kept all the people safe had been torn down and, de and destroyed. Nehemiah was very sad when he heard that. He wept and prayed for the safety of the people of Jerusalem for days. Nehemiah knew that the wall needed to be rebuilt. He knew he had to do something, but he knew he couldn't leave the palace without the king's permission. Nehemiah was a favorite servant of the king. So when Nehemiah told the king what had happened to the wall and his idea of how to do something about it, the king not only allowed him safe passage through his kingdom, he also gave Nehemiah money to pay for the trip and to rebuild the walls. I wonder if Nehemiah was afraid to leave the land he had known for so long. Would you be afraid to leave what is familiar and comfortable in your life? Well, even though he was afraid, Nehemiah chose to trust God and step out in faith instead of giving into fear. When he arrived in Jerusalem, he gathered a team of people to begin rebuilding the wall. And while they built the wall, Nehemiah and his men were made fun of by people trying to stop them. But that didn't stop Nehemiah. No siree. He cared more about what his faith called him to do than what those around him said. The people worked from sun up to sundown, continuing until the walls were complete. Nehemiah became a leader for the people of Jerusalem and the Israelites. He made the choice to listen to the small, quiet voice inside him that many call God, and he did something. Well, the little girl said, that's a good story, Dad, but what does that have to do with me? Well, Nehemiah lived a long time ago, but the world, as you pointed out, still has problems. But just like Nehemiah did, we can listen to that small voice inside of us that calls us to side with love, to do what we know is right and just, and to give voice to those who are not heard or situations that need to have a light shine upon them. We can find solutions and take them to officials who can help fix problems. We can do something. Our guest speaker, Reverend Moss, is going to share that something with us today. I wonder what something you will do to side with love. And with this, our story is told. Until the next time. We take this moment in our service to pause so we can create sacred space within our hearts to reflect on the joys and the sorrows that have come into our lives in recent days. We celebrate each other's milestones and pray with those who need our healing thoughts. We light two flames this morning for this week's birthday celebrations. The first for Cliff M, whose big day is tomorrow, the 8th of March. The second is for Tara C, whose birthday is March 12th. We hope you each have happy birthdays. We light another flame lifting up a different milestone this week for Chris and Bill Kay, who celebrate their wedding anniversary March 11th. Congratulations to both of you. We light a flame of joy for all of our members and beyond who continue to receive COVID vaccines. We hope the time comes soon when all are able to receive them. We light a flame of joy and appreciation from Cindy J for the many folks who have provided books for her guardian ad litem kids. She has enough to start a little library and can rotate books with the 10 children that she now works with. 
we light a final flame for all the joys and concerns that remain unspoken in our hearts. Let us pause in life's pleasures and count its many tears while we all sup sorrow with the poor. There's a song that will linger forever in our ears. Oh, hard times come again no more. Tis the song, the sigh of the weary. Hard times, hard times come again no more. Many days you have lingered around my cabin door. Oh, hard times come again no more while we seek mirth and beauty and music light and gay there are frail forms fainting at the door though their voices are silent their pleading looks will say oh hard times Come again no more It's the song, the sigh of the weary Hard times, hard times Come again no more Many days you have lingered Around my cabin door Oh, hard times Come again no more It's the song, the sigh of the weary Hard times, hard times Come again no more Many days you have lingered Around my cabin door Oh, hard times Come again no more Oh, hard times Come again no more. Our virtual plate offering throughout the month of March will go to Hubbard House, a full service certified domestic violence center serving Duval and Baker counties here in Northeast Florida. Hubbard House has answered more than 100,000 hotline calls and sheltered close to 43,000 survivors and their children in its four-year history. The agency's impact can be measured in suffering spared, lives liberated, and tragic deaths avoided right here in the local community. Your donated dollars are carefully managed and stay local, helping victims and their children. They help Hubbard House achieve its mission of safety, empowerment, and social change for victims of domestic violence. To make a contribution on behalf of our congregation, please find the link to our PayPal giving fund on our YouTube page or our website. Again, thank you for your support. Reverend Tan Moss is pastor of the Greater Grant Memorial AME Church in Jacksonville, and he serves as co-president of iCare. He is an FAMU graduate with degrees in political science and applied social science, and he earned his Master's of Divinity from Atlanta's Interdenominational Theological Center. He's a loving husband, father, and grandfather. Reverend Moss, thank you for joining us. Blessings and peace, my brothers and my sisters. We greet each of you in the strong and the marvelous name of our Savior, Jesus the Christ, and we're so thankful for this wonderful opportunity to share with you on this third Sunday of Lent. Uh, we honor Brother Ken Christensen and thank him for the invitation and for the members of the worship committee, Sister Carol Hawkins and Sister Linda Mowers and Sister Claudia Marshall. And we honor all of the members of the Butler Bridge UU Church for all that you do and for your partnership uh, in this justice ministry here in the city of Jacksonville. 
as gunfire fire ripped through two American cities in an unprecedented 24 hour period, a bleak and tragic milestone was reached here in the United States. With the number of mass shootings reaching a horrific total of 251 on the 216th day of 2019. At that particular point of time, there had been more mass shootings in our nation than the total number of days which had passed on the calendar. In Dayton, Ohio, as Governor Mike DeWine attempted to bring words of comfort and encouragement to the somber crowd assembled at the vigil to show their collective sorrow and support of those who were grieving their losses, the pain, the agony, the fear, the hopelessness and exasperation and sheer frustration of this macabre phenomena was summed up in two words shouted emphatically by the crowd, do something. These two simple but powerful and impactful words do something. They suggest that the matter at hand had reached a critical tipping point and that failure to make immediate action is no longer a convenient option. Do something. It underscored the reality that a heightened sense of urgency should be the order of the day and that urgency should overshadow political posturing or the platitudes of the past. Do something. It gives voice to the sentiment that although thoughts and prayers are always welcome and appropriate, without some tangible demonstration towards meaningful change, thoughts and prayers are little more than what the Apostle Paul described as sounding brass and tingling cymbals. Do something. As people of faith, we have a biblical mandate to do something. The book of James chapter number two, verse number 17, admonishes those who would profess to be people of God that faith itself without a corresponding action in his act, in his, and is in actuality a dead, non-effective, and even would be considered a non-existing faith. Our biblical mandate is grounded in the Old Testament prophecy of Micah, who admonishes the people of Israel, the Lord has told you, O model, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? to act or to do justly, to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. People of faith are very consistent in our walk with the Lord. We serve on various boards and auxiliaries and worship consistently, consistently even in a pandemic for at least 52 times a year. In addition, we exercise mercy through our various ministries that provide temporary but critical relief to those who are in immediate need. We only have to look to the outpouring of aid and assistance provided to the people of Texas during the recent devastation caused by the unprecedented sub-freezing temperatures. Where we as people of faith fall short in our living up to God's uh, directed mandate is in doing justice, or in other words, confronting powerful institutions that cause or acquiesce to the injustice, hopelessness, and suffering and despair in our communities. We understand that the primary reason we fall short in this requirement is because we lack power. And I would suggest to you that powerlessness is always a negative, detrimental state of being for any entity or community. Powerlessness invites abuse, powerlessness. Powerless people, powerless neighborhoods, powerless communities, they get abused and treated unfairly by those who are in power. And this unjust treatment of the powerless leads to entrenched problems, disparities, and systemic injustice that become generational stumbling blocks and barriers to growth, health, and overall well-being of people who are adversely affected. Therefore, a principal goal of our faith community uh, who serves as advocates for justice, equality, and fairness for all people is the need to build power to change unjust systems. But I would submit to you that there are two parallel reasons which aid and abet, abet the faith community occasional apathy toward doing justice. And they include the failure to recognize the urgency of the nature of our responsibility. And number two, the false sense of complacency that is born out of the faith community buying into the narratives and the myth perpetuated by the powerful institutions themselves. For instance, the current slogan in Jacksonville is, it's easier here. The slogan in and of itself begs the obvious question, easier for who? Last year, there were 139 murders and a total of 175 homicides in our city, the most since 1990. 
The rate of violent crimes in Jacksonville has gone up over the past 10 years and is much higher than the majority of the other counties in the state of Florida. Is it easier for neighborhoods who live under the threat of random violence? Florida incarcerates more people than any other state in the country and locks up people for offenses that other states do not. Many people in Florida get arrested for driving on a suspended license. Quite often, licenses are suspended for offenses that don't, don't even involve driving. Last year, 1.1 million people had their driver's license suspended because of a fine or a fee they were unable to pay. Sending people to jail does not put them in a better position to pay their fine. Instead, it traumatizes the family and puts the family in greater poverty. It is certainly not easier for people who are incarcerated for failure to pay a fine or a fee and who sometimes languishes in jail for a whole year without being convicted of a crime. According to JSO, around two thirds of the inmates held in Duval County Jail have not been sentenced. I would submit that it is not easier for those individuals who risk losing their jobs, their homes, their vehicles, and the custody of their children as a result of these extended incarcerations for minor offenses. We spend a lot of money in our city to sustain the myth of easy living. Our city has spent a total of $18 million to demolish the landing, deemed an eyesore and a nuisance by those who want to renovate and refurbish downtown. This is the same city government that refused to spend $300,000 to provide the homeless people in Jacksonville with basic resources. In addition, over a year ago, the city announced $400,000 for a downtown dog park, a 10 minute walk away from the now closed homeless day resource center. Our current administration boasts the vision, one city, one Jacksonville. It appears abundantly clear, however, that we are not a united Jacksonville when one part of the city is worried about the access to scenic views and a dog park, while the other part is concerned about whether they will lose their jobs, their families, and their homes because of being incarcerated for the failure to pay a fine or a fee, or where they will spend the next night or mourning the death of a loved one lost to senseless violence in our streets. As leaders in this ministry and advocates for justice in our individual faith communities, we have an obligation to create a sense of urgency throughout our congregations and to help dispel the myth that it's easier in Jacksonville is an applicable slogan for everyone in Jacksonville. We have an obligation to uncover the false narrative being sold in our communities and create a sense of urgency around our responsibility to change unfair conditions in our city. I'm reminded of Jesus's encounter with the man possessed by an unclean spirit as described in Mark's gospel, chapter number one, verses 21 through 27. Listen how Mark retells this encounter. Then they went to Capernaum. And when the Sabbath came, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. Just then, a man in the synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, What do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, just said Jesus sternly. Come out of him. The impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek. The people were all so amazed that they asked each other, What is this? a new teaching and with authority, he gives orders to even impure spirits and they obey him. According to the National Alliance on Mental Illness or NAMI, uh, in a mental health crisis, people are more likely to encounter police than to get medical help. As a result, 2 million people with mental and emotional illnesses are booked into jails each year. The vast majority of these individuals are not violent criminals. Most people in jails have not yet gone to trial, so they're, uh, they're not yet convicted of a crime. The rest of them are serving short sentences for minor crimes. Once in jail, many individuals don't receive uh, the treatment they need and end up getting worse rather than better. They stay longer than their counterparts without mental illnesses, and they are at risk for victimization, and often their mental health conditions get worse. After leaving jail, most of them no longer have access to needed health care and benefits. 
And the criminal record often makes it hard for the individuals to get a job or housing. And understandably, many individuals, especially without access to mental health services and support systems, end up homeless in emergency rooms or often rearrested. The text recorded here in Mark chapter number one, verses one through 27, documents for us that society's engagement with people suffering mental and emotional illnesses is not a new phenomenon. If I could take license to provide a contemporary spin on this text today, we can envision that people are sitting in church preparing for worship when a deranged, psychotic individual who is probably someone known in the community begins screaming uncontrollably. In our contemporary context, what would happen in this situation is the police would be called, most often leading to the arrest of the individual with the frequency as, as previously described in the NAMI narrative. But remarkably, in this biblical text, we can easily observe three things that Jesus does to challenge the conventional logic and a systemic manner of addressing this type of aberrant behavior uh, that affects an unexpected change and gives impetus for our own reexamination of our perspectives on mental and emotional illness. Jesus, number one, he acted out of the authority that he possessed. Number two, Jesus acted contrary to the established cultural norms. And then number three, Jesus acted in a manner consistent with the best interests of the marginalized individual rather than that of society. Mark's description of Jesus' action in this text centers around one powerful but often overlooked word, authority. Verse number 22, the people were amazed at his teachings because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. In the context of this passage, we note that there are two primary authorities at play or types of authority at play. The first is positional authority. Positional authority is in, intimated in this text and stands in stark contrast to the authority demonstrated by Jesus. But verse 22 says he taught them or Jesus taught them as one who had authority, but not as the teachers of the law. Positional authority demands respect and compliance with certain norms and customs and mores uh, by virtue of one who stands or holds a particular position. Positional authority is expressed in a passive aggressive manner that seeks to demean, diminish, and distance oneself from anyone who challenges that authority or acts in a manner that disturbs the status quo or the established protocol. Positional authority can be a dangerous thing because it often manifests itself in actions that devalue and dehumanize individuals because of the characteristics that are unavoidably inherent in the individuals themselves. Such are those within the communities who suffer from mental illness or emotional illnesses and lack the appropriate care and support. But here in this text, we observe Jesus operating not in positional authority, but in relational authority. Relational authority values humanity in every individual and operates from the context that we are all made in the image of God. Relational authority demonstrates respect for all humanity and recognizes the dignity of all people, particularly those who are challenged in some manner, understanding the biblical principle, but for the grace of God, there go I. Relational authority as demonstrated by Jesus seizes on the opportunity to help rather than to hurt and to act in a compassionate and transformative manner that promotes change for the individual, but also correction of inhuman and unjust systems that exacerbate these situations. As people of faith, we have the biblical and moral mandate to operate from a position of relational authority, recognizing all humanity as cohorts and co-equal with each other or to frame it in a different manner, all humanity is our proverbial brother and we are our brother's keeper. Our relational authority compels us to work for correction of unjust systems that cause suffering, despair and disorder and to build the type of power that demonstrates the, the, the formulation of a national certified crisis team within JSO that is specifically trained and provided the tools to, to appropriately and compassionately handle those individuals in our communities who display the type of behavior Jesus was confronted with in this synagogue scenario. Our relational authority challenges and mandates us as people of faith to express 
or to press for changes of a system that criminalizes poverty and incarcerates people for the inability to pay a nominal non-criminal fee and fine that ultimately causes more economic hardship for the individual and their families than it does to make our communities safer. Our relational authority as partners with all humanity is crystallized in the sentiments of Dr. King who stated, we are all caught in an inescapable network of neutrality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Therefore, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, which makes it incumbent upon each of us to act contrary to the myth and the false narrative proffered by oppressive systems that is easier in Jacksonville, and to confront the reality that for the victimized, the marginalized, and the compressed within our communities, it is not easier. But by the same token, to passionately embrace the truth that as people of faith, we are called to build power, to work towards making the lives of these affected individuals within our community, if not easier, to make them better. And we can do that if we heed the words shouted by the grieving crowd in Dayton, Ohio, almost two years ago, do something. On April 19th at 7 p.m., all of us have the power to do something by bringing three or more people to the Nehemiah Assembly to demonstrate our power to the sheriff and to the state attorney who have made commitments to address these systemic problems in our community. Our gathering will be by Zoom to ensure the promotion of safety and eliminate the potential for the spread of COVID-19. Uh, I purposely did not give this message a title at the beginning so that I could make this declaratory impression as I close. On April 19th at 7 p.m., do something. And the people of God said, Amen. Today's closing words come from American poet Amanda Gorman. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace, and the norms and notions of what just is isn't always justice. And yet the dawn is ours before we knew it. Somehow we do it. Somehow we've weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished. When day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it. For there is always a light, if only we are brave enough to see it. If only we're brave enough to be it. May it be so. Amen. Peace be with you.